Hello and welcome back again to the Young Economist Network, uh, a program that has been launched by ECA and EDEP on macroeconomic modeling for sustainable development. My name is Professor Sylvain Boko, and I will be taking you through this, the third lesson of the first module uh, of the uh, of the course of the macroeconomic course part of uh, the program. And in this lesson, uh, we are going to be spending a bit of time on uh, the ISLM and P model. Uh, if you recall in lesson two, uh, we reviewed the ISLM model and we um, uh, took a look at the formulation of the modelization, how you model uh, both sides of, of that uh, of that tool, the IS side and the LM side, we uh, looked at the conceptualization and as well as the policy implication behind uh, the ISLM model. Now, of course, in lesson two, we were limited by the assumption that the model uh, was uh, essentially uh, looking at a closed economy. So we didn't take uh, account of the external sector. Uh, and therefore we could not, uh, in lesson two, we could not analyze the impact of fiscal uh, or monetary policy on uh, the economy as an open economy. So now in this lesson three, we are relaxing that assumption. And therefore we are taking the model to include uh, the external sector. And once you do that, it becomes an open economy situation where now we are going to consider issues related to the balance of payment, uh, issues related to, uh, to the exchange rate uh, regime, uh, and issues related to the uh, uh, whether or not you have mobility in, in capital flows. So let us start uh, and with this lesson three. once I can move forward. Good. So as I said, uh, we are now um, relaxing. We have relaxed the assumption of a closed economy. We are now in the realm of a open economy. So the first thing that I thought we should consider uh, is uh, now that the, the economy is open, uh, what are the economic goals that the country, such a country, an open country may want to pursue. And essentially most countries uh, today fit under this description of an open, open economy. Um, so in terms of economic goals and purely with respect to the matters of macroeconomic policy that we are concerned with, uh, so the, 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 the goal that uh, the country wants to reach as an open economy is to be able to establish uh, internal and external balance. So uh, to establish balance, meaning equilibrium uh, in the internal market. So internal market, in this case, we are talking about the goods and services market plus the money market uh, and achieving balance or equilibrium in the external uh, market. In this case, external market uh, is really talking about the flow uh, of 
uh, export and or import of goods and services, uh, the flow of capital. So internal, again, internal balance, uh, you know, would refer to uh, what you would say is uh, if you recall from our solo growth model, uh, what you refer to as steady growth, right, of the economy. Uh, you have a low employment rate, markets uh, are in equilibrium, resources are being used efficiently. This basically describes an economy at an equilibrium where we are maximizing, right, the returns on the usage of uh, resources uh, for the maximum output possible in order to satisfy the needs of the population. And then, of course, in terms of external balance, now you're talking about uh, you know, uh, equilibrium between your export and import. So we are talking about trade balance and as well as achieving uh, a desired level of international capital flows. So when uh, the economy is in, uh, you know, in those situations, in those um, you know, sort of steady uh, and, and, and um, equilibrium type of situation in both internally and externally, we talk about, of course, that the, this economy is uh, working in terms of the goals that an open economy would want to reach, okay, for the benefits of uh, its population. So um, we'll start the discussion by uh, briefly considering uh, what is the balance of payment, you know, what constitutes the balance of payment. Again, uh, up to now, we haven't really talked about issues of balance of payment as much. Uh, you recall, if you recall back to the first lesson, okay, when we talked about the circular flow of income, uh, we uh, at one point opened the economy Right, such that you can see the flows uh, of exports that became uh, sort of uh, injections into the, into the economy and then uh, imports that became uh, leakages in, the, in that model of the circular flow of income. If you recall that, uh, what we are doing now is to take that portion uh, of our discussion then, and now magnify it so that you can actually see uh, the basic uh, tenets of the balance of payment. So what do we mean by the balance of payment? Um, so when you are an open economy, any, any, basically any economy you can think of, um, you, you, you would agree with me that transactions don't take place only uh, between the residents of that country, right? So you would agree with me that transactions do take place between, uh, of course, between the residents, but also between uh, the residents of that country and the rest of the world. There are so many things uh, we consume that we cannot necessarily produce within uh, the economy that you are looking at, uh, any of the economies you can look at, right? Uh, so there are so many things that we, we consume that we need to buy from abroad. But the same thing with every country. No country is able to produce all the goods and services that they would want to consume. And so there needs to be trade. And so there needs to be trade between uh, the residents of a particular country, of any country in the world, uh, pretty much, and the rest of the world. So, and some of that, uh, so we will categorize the trade, the transactions, 
between uh, the residents of a country and the rest of the world will characterize some of it apparent. Okay, you know, in the sense that those are, are flows, uh, you understand that is about goods and services, okay, uh, that would flow between the residents of a country and the rest of the world. And we will categorize uh, some of the transactions as capital transactions. This would usually involve uh, flows of money, uh, uh, you know, between anyway, financial transactions, okay, uh, between residents of uh, a country and the rest of the world. Now here, when we use the word resident, uh, it doesn't only mean persons, you know, it doesn't mean only individuals, but rather it includes uh, firms, businesses, governments, uh, even international agencies that are located in the particular country, okay? And so there has to be, you, we have to be able to uh, make a difference between uh, quote unquote resident and quote unquote citizen. So a resident doesn't have to be citizen of that country. Uh, what qualify as resident is that you have a base of business and of exchange and transaction in that country. So you might be of a different uh, uh, citizenship, but as long as you are doing business from that country towards the rest of the world, you are considered for the purpose of balance of payment, you are considered as a resident, okay? So, uh, and, and the balance of payment uh, can also be understood from sort of a statistical per perspective, uh, can be understood as itemizing, right? Uh, the, the different types of transactions that occur, which would um, involve <clears throat> or result in receipts from foreigners, meaning uh, that you know, transaction where resources are flowing to the residents from foreigners, okay, uh, on the one hand, and payments to foreigners on the other hand. Let me take Nigeria. Uh, and as the, as um, my, my country of, of residence, for example, and let's take um, um, UK, okay? So uh, suppose that a, a, a Nigerian um, buys, purchases uh, a Range Rover from the UK, okay? Uh, you see in that transaction, um, the Nigerian is making payments to the uh, firm or the business located in uh, in the UK uh, in return for the Range Rover, okay? So we would say that the, in this case, the Nigerian is importing, right? Uh, the Range Rover uh, into Nigeria and paying, right? So it results in payment to uh, the British residents, okay? Now, on the other hand, suppose that, uh, that, uh, uh, a resident or the government of UK uh, buys, well, buys oil from Nigeria. Let's just uh, assume that. So if the government of UK uh, were to, uh, to then uh, enter into a transaction involving um, Nigeria selling oil to uh, the UK, in that situation, uh, the UK is now paying, is making payments to Nigeria. So those are called receipts, right? Uh, in this uh, in this context, uh, you know. So we are in this case, Nigeria is exporting uh, oil to the UK and receiving right payments from 
the government, let's say, of the uh, United Kingdom uh, in return for the oil. So that's what it's meant by transactions involving receipts uh, from foreigners or uh, payments to foreigners, okay? So this is what the uh, example of that, what that means. So uh, the balance of payment, uh, if you have done a bit of counting uh, or not, that's fine. Uh, but it, it can be thought of as it is actually a double entry register, uh, accounting register of international transactions. That's what we call in balance of payment. Basically everything, every transaction that the, the, the country enters into can be captured, uh, you know, with the rest of the world, can be captured, uh, right, within the context of the balance of payment. So any transaction that results in a receipt, as I explained before, from foreigners, uh, will actually be recorded as a credit and will, be, will have a positive sign. So usually if you look, you think of it as a ledger, okay? And so you have a left-hand side and right-hand side, you just think of it that way. And so let's say the left-hand side, you would record your uh, credit transactions. So they will be recorded as a positive sign. And on the right hand side that you record your uh, debit transactions would, that would be then recorded as uh, a negative sign. So any transaction that would result in payment to foreigners. So in my example, uh, the Nigerian uh, resident is buying a Range Rover from UK that is uh, a payment is that transaction will give rise to payment to uh, foreigners it would be recorded as a debit with a negative sign. Uh, whereas when, uh, let's say the UK purchases, export, uh, purchases oil, uh, petroleum from uh, Nigeria, uh, then of course that would be recorded balance of payment as a credit with a positive sign. Now, the thing to understand about this, because this is the connection to the ISLM model, uh, it's very important to always remember that within the balance of payment, when you are crediting the balance of payment, it usually means uh, that you are receiving payment and see from foreigners. But you see when foreigners are paying you for goods and services they buy from you, they usually uh, would pay you in your local currency. So credits, increased in credits within the balance of payment, uh, on the balance of payment will result will result in more demand for the local currency, okay? Think of it this way. In my example, um, if the UK is buying crude oil from Nigeria, they would want to pay Nigeria in Naira. And so the more crude oil, right, uh, if essentially uh, is, is, is going to be uh, sold in that case, uh, there will be more demand for the Naira, okay? Uh, debits on the other hand will result in more supply of local currency. Why? It's just the opposite. Uh, if you are buying a Range Rover from the UK, uh, you are likely are going to be paying the UK firm in in, in pounds, right? They would want to be in pounds. And therefore you would buy pounds. And to what you do when you buy pounds is that you use the, uh, uh, you, you use the, 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 the money, right? Your local currency in order to buy pounds. So there will be more supply of the local currency in that situation. So credits, uh, on the balance of payment will result in more demand because they need they will need to uh, they will need the local currency in order to buy the goods and services from uh, Nigeria 
Uh, so they will need more more Naira in order to buy the goods and services from Nigeria. And if you are debiting, if you are importing, then you need to pay in the foreign currency. And therefore, uh, it is the demand for foreign currency that will go up and the supply for Naira, because there will be more Naira uh, that would have to be supplied in order to get, uh, in order to buy the foreign currency. Uh, in our case, in our example, uh, the pound as an example. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So here's, I was talking about ledger before, right? So here's an example of a uh, balance of payment uh, uh, account. So uh, on the left-hand side, you have transactions that result in credits, in crediting the balance of payment. So uh, any sale of goods and services or products, so this any export when we are exporting our goods and services. So from Mali, it could be cotton Mali. From Benin, also it could be cotton. Uh, you know, from uh, uh, Morocco, it could be um, you know more industrial goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that are made in Morocco, that are made in Mali, that are made in Benin, and that are being sold abroad, right? Um, any earnings on investment, uh, you know, investment from foreign country, you know, that, that, that residents, investments that residents have made in a foreign country and they are getting earning on that investment, that is positive to the, uh, to the resident country, right? So, for example, if, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, as you know, uh, in fact, uh, a Nigerian businessman owns an airport in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and so the investment uh, in the airport in the UK uh, was an outflow, was an outflow of resources from Nigeria. But any earnings on that, investment that that come back into Nigeria is uh, would be recorded on the balance of payment as a credit okay so essentially any receipt uh, anything that we are getting from foreign uh, sources if you are for example sending if you are living in the US or in France or uh, in Canada and you are sending, a Western Union to your family back in your resident country. That's a credit, right? Uh, foreign aid from, you know, from any country to another, et cetera, et cetera. So anything that results in receipts, in payments to the country is credit. The opposite is true on the debit side. Right, so any purchase of goods and services made from abroad, you are, if you are importing your car, you're importing furniture, you're importing building material, you're importing fridges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those things that you are buying from abroad would be registered, would be recorded uh, as a debit on the balance of payment of your country. Okay, and I described before how a Nigerian owns. Uh, 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 an airport, I believe it's Gatwick, uh, airport in, uh, in the UK. Um, that's an investment, right? When the money was being used that to purchase, right? Uh, that airport, to invest in that airport, uh, that is an investment in a foreign country and that is a negative for Nigeria, a bit. Of course, the earnings are positive but the money that went into the investment in the first place was a debit because it was an outflow. It was, it was going from Nigeria to the UK. So essentially any payment that you make. So if you are here in uh, one of the African countries and you have family uh, in Canada going to school, for example, uh, and, uh, uh, and then you are sending money to your, to your children or your family, that is payment to a foreign country, and that would be a debit uh, 
uh, on the balance of payments, et cetera. So any gift, any aid that you're giving abroad, uh, et cetera. If you buy, if you purchase stock of, of bonds from abroad, that is uh, a negative. Again, you're paying for it. But if you are selling those stocks and bonds, so you're getting the money back into the country of origin, then that is a credit. Okay, so this is typical, uh, typical description of the types of transactions and how they are recorded. Okay, now, so uh, in the balance of payment, we, um, as I say, we recognize some transactions as current uh, transactions and some that are recognized as capital. So you have a current account and a capital account, okay? And the, there's a third account uh, called the official reserves account, uh, which is used to uh, either accumulate or finance uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, deficit or surpluses in the balance of payment. And usually, uh, if you're working with this, uh, this uh, account, there would normally be naturally be some type of statistical discrepancy that uh, would occur. In any case, the balance of payment at the end of the day has to balance out to zero when you look at all the credits and all the debits. So it's just like accounting. So let's go over uh, each of these accounts. Okay, the current account, the current account uh, designates, designates all transactions uh, that would include uh, import or export of goods and services, okay? Um, and, and also uh, unilateral transfers, okay? So uh, again, if we are buying a Range Rover from the UK, okay, that's an import. If we are selling crude oil to the UK, that is an export, okay? If we are receiving foreign aid from the UK, that is a unilateral transfer. If we are making foreign aid, yeah, because remember there was a time when in Nigeria was contributing, for example, uh, to uh, the uh, 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 mobilization of resources in other, uh, other countries. So that's unilateral transfer from Nigeria. It could be a unilateral transfer from the US to uh, any of, uh, of our countries, et cetera. I'll just give you some examples. So those are unilateral transfers that could go either way, okay? Uh, so, so, so then, so when you uh, take uh, the import and export together with uh, these unilateral transfers that could occur, uh, then you have your current account. Okay, so notice that current account involves really uh, transactions that are uh, uh, so that that involve physical goods and services being transferred from one uh, one direction to another direction. You understand? Uh, and so that so most of the time you might have. The, that the situation where the country is importing more than it is exporting. Again, if the country is importing more than it is exporting in a given period of time, in terms of value, the value, if the value of imports exceed the value of exports, or uh, as we have been talking in terms of debits and credits, if the debts, so related to import, exceed the credit related to export, then the country is running what's known as a current account deficit. Okay. Um, and so every year, this is one of the indicators of the health of the economy, whether or not uh, you know, the current account is in deficit. And so if it's in deficit, then there is the, you, you know, the government will have to uh, 
take certain actions in order to deal with that current account deficit. If by chance or uh, you know the transaction during that period of time, let's say a year, uh, are such that exports exceed import. So in our uh, discussion here, let's say credits exceed debits. Uh, then we would say that the country is running a current account surplus, which means that there has been more payments coming from abroad to the country than the country is making payments to uh, foreigners. Okay, that would be a current account surplus. Again, uh, then the government would have to uh, understand what that means because if you have a surplus, then of course in the current account, then what we'll, uh, you know that would sort of uh, uh, mean certain uh, ways of dealing with the surplus uh, in terms of how it affects, for example, your capital your capital account. So your capital account is what we are going to see next. Capital account is saying what it's measuring the difference between uh, the, the sale of assets. So remember, current account, we're talking about goods and services. Uh, capital account, we are talking about assets, usually for uh, uh, financial assets uh, or stocks, uh, et cetera, bonds, et cetera, right? So uh, the difference between your, what you sell to foreigners in terms of assets and what you have purchased, okay, in terms of foreign assets, okay, uh, that is your capital account. So some of these uh, uh, components of capital accounts, foreign direct investment coming in, what, you know what that means, it, you know, it means usually uh, infrastructure investment, roads, um, factories, and, and uh, you know, just, 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 just investment that is, has a more of a structural, uh, you know, effect, okay, on the economy, um, so coming into your country, okay. Uh, so that would sort of be positive uh, capital uh, interest in that sense, right? Uh, portfolio investment. Portfolio here means stocks and bonds, okay? If, uh, if the residents of a country are buying stocks and bonds abroad, money is flowing out, okay? But if residents from abroad are buying stocks and bonds in the source country, in the, re, in the regional country, then more money is flowing in, okay? Uh, so, so that kind of, uh, so, so from a capital account perspective, you're looking at what's happening to assets, to transactions, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, whether it is flowing in or flowing out. So we talk about capital outflow, okay? Capital outflow would mean, as I was explaining before, uh, would be essentially foreign assets, the value of foreign assets that would be purchased, bought by your domestic residents. So uh, what does that mean? You, uh, if, for example, let's take uh, a South African business person who uh, goes and uh, purchases, uh, uh, you know, uh, a factory. Uh, in Canada, okay? Uh, so this is uh, a South African buying or purchasing assets and so has to pay uh, in order to buy those assets and therefore it is a capital outfit, okay? But if a Canadian is buying uh, a, you know, uh, a factory in South Africa, then of course, they will have the, in that case, the Canadian has to pay for it. There will be a, an inflow of, okay. And so the differences between those would be your, what's known as, right, your net outflow, right? So uh, the difference between capital outflow and capital 
inflow is what's known as NCO, uh, the net capital outflow, which could be positive if there's more outflow and there is inflow of capital in any particular year, and it could be negative or it could be zero. Okay. Now, official reserve accounts uh, is essentially uh, every country keeps an official reserve account, which you would usually um, be composed of, of the including, uh, you know, the reserve of foreign currencies, uh, any gold reserve uh, maintained by the country, and uh, special drawing rights. Uh, special drawing rights are sort of these uh, uh, inside currencies, currency that's been developed by the uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, that uh, serves as account transaction accounts uh, between countries uh, in, within the IMF system. Okay, so uh, that's part of the country's official reserve, uh, et cetera. So those are reserve accounts, are, uh, the means by which a country can, if need be, Finance deficits, for example. Okay, uh, you know, so governments must be paying close attention to what's happening to the official reserve account, uh, because sometimes you may see in writings whether or not a country has enough reserve for uh, three months worth of import, for example. Can we have? Does the country have enough assets, enough reserves? in its official reserve account to be able to handle, to pay for, uh, you know, at least three months worth of import. You know, so that is an indicator sometimes of the health of the economy. Okay, so, so that's what's in that uh, uh, account held by government. And then of course, statistical discrepancies, as I said from the beginning, uh, would be when you, you, you know that with all these transactions and calculations and, uh, sometimes the estimations uh, that there would be some uh, errors, that there might be some misrecorded transactions, et cetera. So since the balance of payment has to balance out at the end of the day, so that uh, all uh, 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 credits at the end of the day have to balance, be balanced out by all the debits, uh, if there's a, a change in debit in, in, a, uh, in one account, it, it really, in order for you to say that your balance of payment is a healthy position, uh, you have to be able to balance that out by credit in another account. In other words, for example, what I mean is if you have a debit in the current account, so if you are having that the import exceeding export in the current account. So you have a current account deficit. Your, the, your health, the health of the economy is judged by whether or not in such a situation, the capital account is at the same time recording a net credit to balance out the deficit in the current account, because at the end of the day, balance of payment has to balance out to zero. So this statistical discrepancy is a tool, a plug-in uh, that is used in order to uh, account for those errors and possible uh, mistakes in terms of recording transactions. So here's an example again, these are just numbers uh, but this, so he, here's how you would record your credit and debits notice uh, the current account and within the current account you have uh, three sub accounts okay so sub account number one export okay and so under export you have your uh, merchandise export you have services 
they have factor income, okay? So if you are uh, from, uh, you are a Malawian and you went and work in, uh, let's say Zimbabwe, and so, and that, so you are paid wages is factor income. Labor is a factor uh, of production. So that's factor income. So those kinds of things, uh, so merchandise export services, export services, uh, banking services, for example, right? Uh, factor income, all of those will be reported under export. Uh, and, and that would be, let's say your first account of uh, sub account of your current account. Now, the second sub account is imports. Imports as we are recorded as negative, whereas exports are recorded as positive. You, you know that's the case because we defined exports as um, transactions that result in payment to the resident country from foreigners. Imports are negative because these are transactions that involve payment from the resident country of a country to foreigners. So they are negative, they are outflows. So again, merchandise, uh, services, and also factor income. So when you, uh, when, for example, we, um, we utilize the services of uh, a technical assistance, uh, you know, under technical cooperation that a consultant will come from abroad. And so the country is paying for that consultant's time and labor. Uh, that is factor income flowing out of the resident country. Okay. And unilateral transfers, remember I, I explained that. So uh, if it is unilateral transfer coming into the country, foreign aid, for example, is, is a unilateral uh, transfer because on the face of it, it is not being, uh, there's nothing being asked in return for uh, foreign aid on the face of it. And so it's unilateral transfer. If the transfer were to come out of uh, you know, the resident country to foreigners, that is a negative unilateral transfer, okay? Uh, so in that situation, you would record all incoming unilateral transfer as positive, and then you will recall all outgoing unilateral transfers as uh, as negative, okay? So the the current account balance, current account balance, would be the sum, right, of all the positives and all the negative transactions. That sum, one, so sub account one plus sub account two plus sub account three, right? Uh, uh, that would be the your balance, the current account balance. In this particular case, it is coming out to be negative, negative 463. What that means is that when I take all the imports, I sum them up, and I take all the exports and I sum them up, okay? It means that the uh, imports exceed all the exports by 463. So there is a negative uh, current account. Now, the capital account. So under the capital account, you also have sub accounts. Okay. So uh, you would have direct investment. So if it's foreign direct investment, for example, coming to the country, that's positive. If it's direct investment outflowing from the country to a foreign country, that would be reported as a negative, as a debit. Portfolio investment, right? So sub-account five, let's say, 
uh, equity securities, debt securities, derivatives, etc. These are different portfolios where you take shares in uh, a company, right? For example, okay. So if it is coming into the country once again, it's negative. It's coming out of the country. It's positive. Okay. So when you sum up, right? So you have other investment uh, sub account six. When you sum all that up, okay, uh, that gives uh, what is known as the balance on capital accounts. The balance on capital accounts. So your capital account balance. Now in this case, you see it's, it's positive, okay? So then the, the inflows in this particular example, the capital inflows, okay, exceed the capital outflows. So there is a positive balance in the capital account. It's encouraging for the economy. However, um, the capital account 188 is not enough to overcome the uh, current account deficit 463, negative 463. And so the statistical uh, discrepancies okay, are used to try and balance those out, right? Errors, uh, misrecorded transaction, misrecorded transactions and so on, okay? And so this is estimated to be 267.8 in this situation, so that the overall balance of this particular example uh, comes out to be uh, negative 6.3. And so, as I said from the beginning, uh, the official reserve account is that account that where the government uh, is uh, expected to keep enough reserves to be able to balance out whatever uh, negative uh, impacts may be occurring in terms of balance of payment. In this case, we recorded it to be 6.3 as well so that the balance of payment balance out to be zero. Notice the overall balance, negative 6.3, the official reserve account, 6.3, and so that the overall uh, balance payment uh, is zero, which is where you want to uh, be in this case. So all of that was to sort of set the situation up so that we can understand uh, what it is that we are adding to the ISLM model. And what we are adding to the ISLM model is this balance of payment curve, BP curve, okay? The BP curve. So that it, before in lesson Two, we were concerned only with the internal balance, with goods and services market, with the money market. We didn't have a situation of an open economy. In lesson three, we are now in a situation of an open economy. Uh, we conducted a review of what uh, a balance of payment means because when you we are now in a situation of an open economy, it means that you have to take into account all transactions occurring between the residents of a country and the rest of the world. And those transactions are registered, are recorded under what's known as the balance of payment. And so, when we understand the balance of payment in terms of as an account, as an accounting device, we now want to bring into the modeling context, okay? And remember our model, the ISLM model was establishing a relationship between interest rate and the output, okay? And we have just 
we have just reviewed what we mean by a balance of payment uh, in equilibrium. Now, when it is in balance, I like like this table, okay? So that the balance is essentially uh, comes out to be zero, right? Uh, so when you have a situation, okay, where the current account surplus, the current account surplus is exactly offset by the current account deficit, I mean, the capital account deficit or vice versa. If you had a current account deficit, then it should be exactly offset by the capital account surplus. Such a situation is described as the balance of payment equilibrium. Okay, so Let's go back here. What I'm describing is this. Suppose that uh, after the current account, we see that there's a deficit of negative 463. All right. Just suppose, this is not what we have here, but suppose that under the capital account. Suppose that we had found that the capital account balance was a positive 463. Suppose in such a situation, we would say that the balance of payment is in equilibrium. And therefore, you don't need an official reserve account. It would be zero, right? In that case, the official reserve account would be zero because the balance of payment was already in an equilibrium situation where the deficit in the current account would be exactly offset by the surplus in the capital account. So that's our definition of balance of payment equilibrium. And therefore, let's go back to the beginning. The balance of payment curve will track the combinations of interest rate and output that result in balance of payment being in equilibrium as we have just described. Okay, so this is the new addition to our model that we developed in lesson two. Let's spend a bit of time. Uh, this, let me take you, you see this is the, the, the three markets in equilibrium, the ice, the LM curves and the balance of payments. So I, I'm going, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but just so you can see, okay, visually what I was meaning by equilibrium, right? In both the balance of payment, the external and internal uh, markets. But let's go back to uh, describing the balance of payment curve. Now, Let's just pick some situations and then see how they would affect the balance of payment curve as we have described it. Suppose that the home country, okay, experiences an increase in the interest rate for whatever reason, okay? Now, you see, when you have an open economy and you have uh, 
uh, capital mobility, uh, or you may not, in fact, have capital mobility, we would see those situations. Okay. But the point is when you have a higher interest rate at home, in the home country, foreign investors want to take advantage of that higher interest rate. Again, if you have a higher interest rate in the home country, what does, what does that mean? It means that if I have right a billion dollars to invest and I'm looking at where I can get a quick return I look at all the countries, uh, at, at some point, all the interest rates would sort of be similar. But the moment there is one home country, the one, one country where the interest rates begin to go up, then I can make a quick return, right? By taking advantage of that. So there would be an inflow, inflow of capital, right? Into the home country. And so for that inflow of capital to be paid for, there would be a demand for the local currency. Remember before, credit means uh, demand for local currency go up. When there is a higher demand for local currency, the currency, the local currency, the Naira, if it's in the case of Nigeria, is the home country, the CD, if it's the case of Ghana being the home country, uh, the CFA franc, if it's the case of Senegal being the home country. So that when there's an inflow of capital, there is a higher demand for the local currency. And the higher demand for local currency means the currency gains in value, gains in value, we say, that the currency has appreciated. So there is currency appreciation in that situation. Let's recap it. Home country has higher interest rate. Foreign investors see an opportunity to make a quick return. There is an inflow of capital. Inflow of capital means higher demand for local currency local currency appreciates. So currency appreciation. Similarly, if the interest rate in the home country were to go down, right? If the interest rate were to go down compared to the rest of the world, okay? You would see quickly foreign investors will take out their money because they'd, they'd rather not lose their money. Right, the interest rate is what you earn on money, right? So, uh, so they will take their money out. There will be an outflow of capital. Then there will be a reduced demand for the local currency, which means there is a, a, a higher supply of the local currency. And therefore the currency loses value and so we say that the currency depreciates, right? This will become uh, more important when we, we start talking about policy, okay? So that's one side of it. So let's keep that, right? Higher interest rate, higher inflow of capital, higher demand for local currency, appreciation of the local currency. Low interest rate, outflow of capital, lower demand for local currency, depreciation of local currency. Keep that in mind and we will use that knowledge later. Now, how you draw the BP curve depends on what's known as capital mobility. 
capital mobility refers to the ease with which you can take out assets, money, et cetera, from the home country or take in those assets or uh, uh, money, financial resources, et cetera. When capital is perfectly mobile, meaning that there is absolutely no restriction on how much you can take out of the country or how much you can take into the country. So that is a, a situation of perfectly mobile capital, perfect mobility. Then the balance of payment curve is horizontal is a horizontal line, okay? When capital is not perfectly mobile, so there is some restriction, but not totally. Okay, so the government would put some limit on how much can come into the country or come out of the country. You see many countries have such limits. Then the balance of payment curve is upward sloping, upward sloping. When capital is perfectly immobile, meaning there is total restriction on foreign currency, on um, how much you can take out, total restriction, okay? So the it means essentially that there cannot be a response of inflow or outflow of capital to changes in the interest rate. In that situation, the BP curve is vertical. All right, so this gives you the different, uh, different uh, uh, ways that you can represent the BP curve depending on capital mobility. Perfectly mobile, the BP curve is horizontal. In perfect mobility, the BP curve is upward sloping. But when you have perfectly immobile, so there will be no response at all because of government restrictions, uh, then the BP curve is vertical. Now, let's look at some of these equilibrium conditions. If you followed everything we have been discussing so far, it means that you now have to have equilibrium conditions holding in three markets, right? In lesson two, we only consider the goods market and the money market. In this lesson three, you now have right, the external markets included, which means you have to have balance or equilibrium in all three markets, okay? In order to say you have, you, that you are satisfying at once, right? All three markets. So let's look at the goods market. What has changed? When we open the economy, what has changed in the goods market? Notice that in lesson two, we did not have import and export because the economy then was assumed to be closed. Okay. Now we have import and exports in a situation of an uh, open economy. Therefore, our equation, equilibrium equation has to take that into account. And so instead of Y equal to C plus I plus G only, we now have net export, NX, export minus import, added to the equation. Right, so 
y is equal to c plus i plus g plus nx, the balance in the current account. Okay, so that is now an open economy uh, derivation of the IS curve. That's where the IS curve comes from in an open economy. And if you uh, think about it, when you have an increase in NX, the IS curve will shift to the right. Okay, so when export exceeds import, it means that NX is positive. That is a, um, a credit, that is a, um, a surplus in the current account this would shift the IS curve to the right. On the other hand, when import exceeds export, okay, the NX here is now entered as a negative. That is a debit, that is a deficit in the current account, and that would shift the IS curve to the left. So increases in NX shifts the IS curve to the right, decreases in NX shift the IS curve to the left. That's the goods market equilibrium. What about the money market equilibrium? In the money market equilibrium, we haven't changed anything. If you notice so far, I haven't touched I haven't talked about the, the quantity of money or money demand or any of those things internally. So the LM curve stays the same. So the equilibrium conditions that we had seen in lesson two remain the same. Okay. Now, the balance of payment equilibrium is what I have just described a moment ago. So it is where uh, the current account deficit, if there were to be deficit, would be exactly offset to the capital uh, by the capital account surplus, or vice versa. Okay, in any case, the official settlement reserve would be equal to zero. That, that is what's known as balance of payment equilibrium described by, represented by the BP curve. So those are the three market equilibrium conditions that we now have to strive for, right? In our analysis. In other words, every time that the model or the economy okay, is thrown off from all three equilibrium conditions holding simultaneously, then forces would come into play to push the market back towards that equilibrium point, all right? So here it is, uh, the IS curve, now, including the annex, is still downward sloping. That has not changed. The LM curve, so that's the blue IS. LM curve is the green one. That has not changed. We haven't uh, 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 made any modification. The uh, balance of payment curve here, the red one, so as we have described before, in this particular representation, this will be a situation of imperfect mobility, imperfect capital mobility, so that the balance of payment is positively sloped. At E, equilibrium E, you see that all three markets are holding in terms of conditions for equilibrium. And 
I star and Y star constitute the combination of interest rate and output, which clears the all three markets simultaneously at the same time. Okay. So every time something happens and the economy moves away from that equilibrium point, again, forces would come into play to draw the economy back to that equilibrium point. So let's now look at policy impact. Uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy, what would be the impact of such policies in an open economy? That's the question. Those are the questions that we will deal with uh, up to the end of this particular lesson. First of all, let us look at monetary policy on the fixed exchange rate. Ah, you ask me what is exchange rate and what is fixed exchange rate. So the exchange rate the exchange rate is essentially the amount of foreign currency that you can purchase with one unit of the home currency. You can also define it the other way around. You can define it as the amount of local currency that you can purchase with one unit of foreign currency. So for example, you might ask uh, one euro, pick one euro, how many units of CFA francs can one euro purchase? And the answer is approximately 655, I believe. So the exchange rate between the euro and the CFA franc is approximately 655. Okay, so one euro can be used to buy 655 units of CFA franc. And by the way, that relationship, that exchange rate is pretty much fixed. So that is a, an example of a fixed exchange rate. Okay, so until some other decision is made, you will always see that one euro buys approximately 655 units of CFA francs as a fixed exchange. But let's say I take um, uh, the, just as an example, the dollar and uh, the Naira in Nigeria. So um, you can ask the question, how many units of Naira can $1 buy? Okay, so officially, I believe it's about 480. It could, it could vary and it varies, right? Sometimes it's, it goes down, sometimes it goes up. In other words, sometimes you might buy, be able to buy closer to 500 units of Naira, or you might be able to buy, uh, you, if the Naira appreciates, for example, then you might buy uh, uh, less than that, maybe closer to 100, 450 units of Naira. So you see in that situation it would be a situation of what's known as floating exchange rate. It is not fixed between the dollar and the Naira. So the value would change as a result of a combination of things, right? Market forces, government policy, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so those are examples, two examples, one of an exchange rate that is fixed uh, between the Euro and the uh, CFA francs and an exchange rate uh, that is floating, okay? Um, and, and floating means market forces, the, the value of the exchange rate, right, uh, will depend to some extent or large extent on market forces. Okay, there's always some government policy uh, that would uh, affect the eventual value, uh, but it is not a policy to keep the value fixed. Okay. And so um, we will start with looking at monetary policy and the fixed exchange rate. Okay. Uh, Suppose that you have perfect capital mobility, meaning government does not intervene in the amount of foreign assets or domestic assets that are transacted. So um, you have perfect capital mobility, which means there's immediate response to changes in the interest rate, any, any little increase in interest where we'll see a huge inflow of capital, but at the same time, any little decrease in interest rate would see a huge outflow of capital. And therefore the balance of payment is a horizontal, okay? The IS curve is still uh, um, uh, negatively sloped and the LM curve is still Positively. Now, so the situation we want to analyze is suppose that the central bank increases the money supply. So this is a situation, if you recall from lesson two of an expansionary monetary policy, how does that affect our results now that we have an open economy? And in this case, particularly under fixed exchange rate. So if the central bank increases the money supply and you start from equilibrium E in, uh, in this picture, in this figure, the LM curve shifts to the right, okay? And the new temporary equilibrium establishes at E prime, okay? Notice that at E prime, the interest rate is below the equilibrium interest rate. Output is higher, okay? But since the interest rate is below the equilibrium interest rate, there will be, remember we are, we are assuming a perfect capital mobility, there will be a huge outflow of capital as a response. When there is a huge outflow of capital, okay, causing deficit in the official settlement, what will happen? Well, the uh, the foreign the currency, the local currency, will depreciate. We saw that before. Okay, a large outflow of capital, the local currency will depreciate. And depreciation uh, means what? Since it is a fixed exchange rate that we are analyzing, what would happen is that the central bank will be obliged, would be forced, because they want to keep a fixed exchange rate, would be forced to buy back the domestic currency. Okay, and to buy back means that they are selling foreign currency. Again, remember, let's let's go back, let's go back to this again. The idea is the central bank wants to influence the economy in this 
conditions of fixed exchange rate and perfect capital mobility, the central bank wants to influence the economy through monetary policy. It tries to do so by increasing the money supply, the domestic money supply, obviously, right? So when it does that in an open economy, uh, the result is that the interest rate, because there's now more money than before flow of, uh, floating in the economy, the interest rate goes down. The price of money goes down and it's lower than the equilibrium interest rate. So investors will take their money out. There will be a large outflow of capital. When that happens, right? Outflow of capital means essentially that the demand for the local currency goes down. And so the local currency will uh, be, will feel pressure. There will be pressure for on the currency to depreciate. But remember it's a fixed exchange rate regime. So the central bank cannot under this condition let the local currency depreciate. So what they're gonna have to do is to buy back the local currency and therefore they would completely go back to the situation before. They would erase completely whatever temporary effects we were having at E prime by the fact that when there is a pressure on the currency to depreciate under a fixed exchange rate, exchange rate um, the monetary authorities cannot allow it to happen and therefore they have to buy back the currency. By buying back the currency, they then offset what they have uh, done with the action that they had posed before, which was to increase the money supply, right? And so the LM curve moves back to its original position. And so the end result is that when you are under fixed exchange rate, monetary policy is ineffective. Under fixed exchange rate, monetary policy is ineffective. Okay. Now let's look at a situation of a fixed exchange rate, but Fiscal policy now. Fiscal policy, again, assuming fixed exchange rate, and we will still assume perfect capital mobility. So the uh, BP curve is horizontal. IS curve is still negatively sloped as we expect. LM curve positively sloped. So the government proposed uses an expansionary fiscal policy. They increase the gov government expenditure or they decrease taxes, either one or a combination. What that does is that it shifts the IS curve, IS curve to the right, okay? So temporarily, the economy establish a short run equilibrium at E prime, short run equilibrium at E prime. E prime occurring on the new IS curve, IS prime, and the old LM, okay? Now, what do you notice there? At that point, the interest rate is higher, the domestic interest rate is higher than the equilibrium interest rate. So the opposite of what we just saw before, right? So the when you have the interest rate being higher than the equilibrium interest rate, okay? there would be a large inflow in this case, right, uh, of capital, causing a capital account surplus, okay? In that, such a situation, there would be a pressure on the domestic currency to appreciate. But remember, we are under fixed exchange rate. So the 
uh, central bank cannot allow the domestic currency to appreciate either. It's a fixed exchange rate. Therefore, what would happen is that now the central bank will sell the domestic currency and buy foreign currency in order to counterattack the pressure on the domestic currency to appreciate. Okay, but by doing so, by selling the domestic currency, the money supply, domestic money supply increases. And when that happens, the LM curve shifts to the right, establishing a new equilibrium, long run equilibrium at E double prime. And notice that at E double prime, income is much higher than it was either at the uh, original equilibrium or the short run equilibrium. And so when you have a fixed exchange rate, fiscal policy is highly effective. And where effective here means what is the effect on output, on income, et cetera, right? And so the comparison here is from E, the original equilibrium to E double prime, the long run equilibrium. And it all has to do with the relative uh, position of uh, interest rates in the country with respect to the rest of the world and the assumptions that we have made, okay? So fiscal policy, highly effective under a fixed exchange. Okay. Now, let's look at uh, the other option, which is floating exchange rate. So exchange rate, as I explained before, is floating when its value is determined by market forces by supply and demand within the market, in the market for, uh, for currencies, okay? So again, we will continue to assume perfect capital mobility. The BP curve is therefore horizontal. Suppose that the um, central bank increases money supply. So we start with equilibrium E, where all three markets are in equilibrium. All three markets are in equilibrium at E. The money market, the goods market, the external market. They're all at equilibrium at E. When the, uh, and remember this floating exchange rate, when the central bank increases the money supply, the LM curve shifts to the right, okay? There will be a short run equilibrium established at E prime. 